Hello and welcome to the 2022 SHIELD Conference. We want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to dive into current Gulf War illness research as well as upcoming Gulf War illness research that you can be on the lookout for later this year. My name is Sarah Moynian and I am the Social Media Program Coordinator for the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine and I will be your host today. We have an exciting lineup of speakers joining us today. If you would notice within your control panel, there's a Q&A tab. If you have any questions during the presentations, please feel free to type it in within that section and we'll do our best in answering all of your questions. The conference is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel within the coming days. I wanna thank everyone again for joining us today and I will begin by introducing the director for the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, Dr. Nancy Klimas. Dr. Klimas is the Dean of Research and Professor of Medicine at the Dr. Kiran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine and Chair of the Department of Clinical Immunology at Nova Southeastern University. In partnership with the Miami Veterans Affairs Medical Center's Gulf War Illness Research Program, the INEM is a multidisciplinary research and clinical institute that takes a systems biology approach to understanding complex medical illnesses, such as myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and Gulf War illness. Dr. Klimas is Professor Emeretta at the, at the University of Miami's Muller School of Medicine, a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine, a diplomat of a diplomat in diagnostic laboratory immunology, and director of clinical immunology research at, my, at the Miami Veterans Affairs Medical Center. She has achieved national and international recognition for her research and clinical efforts in multi-system disorders, including MECFS and Gulf War illness. She is the past president of the International Association for CFS and ME, and a past member of the Health and Human Services CFS Advisory Committee. I will now hand it over to you, Dr. Klimas. Well, thank you, Sarah, and thanks everybody for attending this conference. Um, you can hear me okay? Everything's good? Yeah, perfect. Great, super. So uh, for those of you that are new to this conference, this conference has a tradition. And the reason why we do this is to thank the many Gulf War veterans who have served not once, but twice. First to serve their country, of course, uh, when your military service and in the Gulf War, but second to serve your fellow veterans all over again by participating in research that tries to get to the answer of this miserable illness and move us into therapies that could be effective. We can't do this without you and your volunteerism. And to me, this is straight out patriotism to do this all over again when you're not feeling well and, and making this huge effort to uh, participate in the, in the work that the various researchers are doing to try to get to the answers and get solutions for you. So thank you. This is basically a thank you conference. But let me tell you, um, my, my job is to do a quick review of the work that we're doing at the Institute here, at the Institute for Neuromune Medicine, which is a collaboration between uh, Nova Southeastern University and the Miami VA uh, research program. And, um, and I'm gonna give you a, a quick update. I've done this uh, presentation before, so some of the slides will be familiar, but mostly they're here. They'll tell you what we're up to. So anyway, here at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, um, we're a big group. I don't think you might realize, but we are actually, um, we started uh, 10 years ago, though frankly, we've been doing Gulf War work a lot longer. So we gathered a group of Gulf War illness investigators from many different universities and we home-based from Nova Southeastern University. And we have, I think 17 faculty and 50 or so uh, people all together working on this, which is very exciting. So it's a great big group. I think we are the largest group in the country. And, and that didn't work. Devil. I'm sorry, give me just a moment. I am having technical difficulties. Is this working now? Yes, finally. All right, and this is a long list of people that you don't have to read, but you can see the point of this is that we have systems biology, we have laboratory science, we have animal modeling, we have clinical trials, and we have clinical care all all enveloped in this one great big research group that is really cool because we can take things from clinical observation back to the basic scientists to explore what the mechanisms are, have them work out the mechanisms, uh, have the computational scientists work 
out models that give us new therapeutic directions, then test that in animal models and bring it all the way forward into the, into the clinic again so that we actually are doing the trials. It's, it's a one-stop shopping kind of place and it's exciting. In this session, I'm I get to open things. I'm gonna talk about a little bit what we're doing and why we're doing it. Obviously, this is an audience that doesn't need to know what is Gulf War illness, but it is a miserable illness. And we've spent a great deal of time, all of us in the world, not just our group, trying to get at the causes. And at this point in time, because it's been 31 years, it's, it's more about what's causing it to persist than necessarily being able to focus down on what caused it to start. Though, honestly, there's a, quite a bit of work that, that points right at the, the military toxic exposures at the time of the, of the Gulf War, the very mixed bag of many toxins, but including organophosphates and the oil well fires and pesticides and so on. There was a, a, it was like a perfect storm of toxic exposures during the, during the inciting events that started um, the process. Then we'll talk about um, what we're doing and uh, the diagnosis. Uh, the, we, this mainly because you are, again, people that have helped us with our research, you understand that when we're trying to understand Gulf War illness, we have to define it in some way so that we are treating the people or studying the people that have the illness. Sometimes that makes the case definition a little tight. Sometimes people are upset because they can't get in the study because they have something like, say, uncontrolled diabetes or something else going on that would make it very difficult to sort out what's what. But um, I think that you can appreciate that um, in science, you gotta sort of draw the smaller circle to understand the bigger circle. So that's what um, pretty much we have to do. But it's an illness that is um, across multiple systems with many, many different symptoms. And, and as I say, it can be very disabling. What do we know about the cause? Well, we know a lot about the cause that the neurotoxins uh, seem to play a key role, particularly the pesticides, organophosphates, in the animal models um, of the disease, they've really focused in on using organophosphates and sarin as the, as the um, inciting agent, but it's uh, a little more complicated than that, uh, even in the animal models. Uh, and that we've, there's been a lot of work on risk, on genetics of risk, and these seem to circle around detoxification patterns. It makes sense if one person in three remained ill after their exposures to these toxins in the Gulf War, that perhaps there's a genetic factor that makes about one third of the population more vulnerable. And that would seem to be the case that the, the ability to detoxify some of these toxins is slow in some people normally, but if you put them in a really intense exposure, they're more likely to get over that threshold into the point of illness and, and chronic illness. And then, uh, as I said, we're really focused down more on illness persistence at this point. Is there some way that we can change the course of this illness that has persisted for 30 years? Our research would say, yes, you can. So that's exciting. And um, we're not the only people working. If you pull up clinicaltrials.gov and just put in the keyword Gulf War illness, you will find that there's 61 trials listed, 61, 15 currently recruiting. So there's a lot of work going on in Gulf War illness. Um, and it's been well-funded in large part because of the advocacy of the veterans with this illness to go back to Congress again and again and again and said, I'm still sick, please pump money into this field until there's an answer. And, and honestly, none of this work could be happening if the advocates hadn't worked so diligently to make sure that this did not become the forgotten illness. This is just a screenshot of a clinicaltrials.gov webpage. I just wanted to show you how easy this is. You can go to that webpage, key in Gulf War, kick a button that says actively recruiting, and then you'll come up with these, the names of the trials that are currently going on. And it's, it's a law that says, if you accept federal funding, you have to be on trials.gov. So this is a pretty solid, comprehensive list. So. Uh, be aware. So what is the focus of the work? Well, a lot of the work is on the inflammation involved. Now, no surprise to you with Gulf War illness that there's inflammation involved with Gulf War illness. You feel like it, right? Your body feels like it's inflamed. And so does your brain. And when you look at the studies, 
you're dead on. If I listen well with my doctor ears and I say my patient says they have a lot of inflammation, you shouldn't be surprised that when we pull out our fancy tools that we find that inflammation. But it is actually pretty cool that you can look at the brain. This is some work that was done by Jim Baranek and, um, and Dr. Al Shell that, that showed um, using imaging scans that focus on straight up inflammatory markers in the brain that there is indeed demonstrable, measurable, abnormal inflammation in the brain. So that's important. It gives us a focus. Um, and of course, our group is very engaged in this. In fact, Dr. Nathanson and our group is working with Dr. Baranuk in, the, in these studies and is doing a lot of the genetic transcription and immune regulation work that um, was trying to explain the underpinnings of this inflammation, what cells are doing what and what regulates them so that there might be a hope to turn something off that's been turned on and try to quiet down the brain. We also have studies going on that follow the work of um, Dr. Abudanya and Dr. Sullivan uh, that look at autoantibodies in the brain. And we've taken that bench work all the way to clinical trial. And we have a study now for people that have brain autoantibodies, it's just to say antibodies that are attacking specific areas of the brain, uh, using the kinds of treatments used in rheumatology that quiet antibody production. So we have a very exciting study there that I'll talk about in a little bit um, that's again focused on brain inflammation as a target for intervention. Um, we just finished this CoQ10 study. Uh, was, we had ridiculous uh, problems with recruitment. I can, it's a theme that you're gonna hear is that everything about research in Gulf War illness, the rate limiting step right now is always recruitment, finding enough study subjects for the studies. Without the study subjects, it just can't go on. And this study that I thought we could finish in two years took us four years to fully recruit. That was finished right before uh, COVID or right at the tail beginning of the COVID. So well, you can't blame COVID for the lousy recruitment though it, it sort of did screw us up a bit because we were still recruiting when it started. But um, anyway, the long and the short of it is this study is finally done. We've spent a solid year since the close of this study um, analyzing all of the data um, and getting all the biologic markers uh, analyzed. And it's finally, finally coming together. All those analytes are in a data set right now. And we hope to be writing this paper in just the next few weeks. So very exciting that we're finally to the point where we can um, uh, present the results. Unfortunately, I can't present it today because you're not allowed to talk about your results before you put the paper in. It's sort of a one of those rules for publication, and I apologize. I wish I could tell you more right now, but you'll know in very short order. Um, another, that this CoQ10 paper is coming off the the heels of a lot of oxidative stress work. Um, oxidative stress is when your body, in trying to make energy, should be able to clean up the, the byproducts of energy production, which are called free radicals. But when they fail to, these free radicals build up in the cells and actually really muck up the ability of cells to function correctly and can even destroy the cell and can be the source of inflammation if the cell actually dies. So dead cells, particularly in the brain, drive neuroinflammation. So oxidative stress is a key feature of what is going on um, in MECFS, both in the body and in, I mean, in Gulf War illness, in both the body and the brain. Um, uh, and of course, we're really focused on the brain because um, the brain regulates the entire uh, body systems. So, but treating oxidative stress becomes a really key feature. And using antioxidants that cross the blood brain barrier is very important. As it happens, CoQ10 doesn't cross the blood brain barrier that well. It's better for the body than it is for the brain. And so there's a lot of work trying to find things that do cross. And we're doing a study with liposomal glutathione. It does cross curcumin. It does cross. Uh, the Ross Camp Institute is in the closing year of this study uh, that you'll hear about shortly because they'll be speaking. Um, and um, as you can see, and these aren't the only studies that look focused on antioxidants or using uh, antioxidant combinations. Uh, Beatrice Gollum has a good study underway. Um, we have a, several studies that we'll be talking about that actually I get to talk about in a moment. That will, uh, there we go. So um, this is one, the liposomal glutathione curcumin study. We're in the final month of recruitment of this study and we were anxious to get 
<coughs> another couple dozen, or not dozen, about a dozen more people in. <coughs> and um, it's an easy study. It's a virtual study at this point. You don't have to come in to be in this study. If you could reach, if you're anywhere in the country, you can be in this study. And um, it's looking at whether or not liposomal glutathione or curcumin versus placebo uh, helps uh, people with Gulf War illness. And we do a lot of biologic workup with blood work that we have um, drawn by the local Quest Lab. So uh, it's something that we've we managed thanks to COVID to adapt our protocol design so that you don't have to be in South Florida to participate. Oh, there we go. So um, the other thing that is a focus of clinical trials is whether you can de improve these detoxification pathways. One of the things in Gulf War illness, yes, you were poisoned initially. Why would you still 30 years later be sick from this kind of poisoning? Well, the fact is that there's a lot of poisons in your day-to-day -day existence. And if you're a poor detoxifier, if there's ways to improve your ability to detoxify the pesticides that are being sprayed in your office, in your homes, that the mycotoxins that are in your foods and in the mold in your environment and so on, all these things are things that can further trigger or continuously trigger the kind of neuroinflammation in Gulf War illness. And so some of these studies are looking at ways to improve detoxification. And uh, Dr. Grant recently uh, com completed this study, and this is a paper that he's now published looking at um, whether or not you can look at the number of exposures people, if there's a biomarker, a way of sort of having a yardstick in the body to look at how many times your, 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 your body's been dinged by toxins. And he has a way of looking at the DNA itself and the DNA repair mechanisms as a measure of uh, detoxification. And he was able to show actually that this evidence that there is a chronic insult because the, the body's work to try to repair DNA in Gulf War illness is upregulated in a chronic way. Every single day, there's more DNA repair than would be normal, uh, was shown in his study. It's an exciting study and it shows, which is kind of cool, that your body's trying to repair itself, which is wonderful. It's better than sitting down and saying, you know, I'm done. <laughs> if your body is working hard to try to get better, that's very good news. Um, there's a lot of work on hormones and hormone regulation. Again, and the brain is involved in an illness and the neuroinflammation, oxidative stress in the brain is involved. Then the regulation of normal hormones is going to be affected because that's a brain function. The hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are up there working hard to try to keep everything in a normal balance and it gets off kilter. And so basically all of the hormones in the body can be a little knocked off. The thyroid hormone, the adrenal gland, the um, testosterone levels or estrogen levels and so on. In our studies where we try to understand the interaction of all these different systems together in a computational model, in a computerized model of, of what's going on, this neuroendocrine balance is a critical feature of why people stay ill. And in the study that we have going on that we've nicknamed the reboot study, where we're trying to reboot all these pathways back to normal, um, um, we actually manipulate the hormone balance to try to reboot uh, the neuroendocrine system and the brain back into a normal balance. Uh, Dr. Seguera is doing a, a study using growth hormone. This is an animal model study, but he's got some early uh, data that's looking promising. And so uh, he's excited about this. He's got a bunch of mice with Gulf War illness modeled mice in the, in the cages right now receiving um, these growth hormone uh, antagonists to see if they can uh, affect the way their brain and growth hormone affects um, healing in the body. We do a lot of work uh, looking at men and women uh, and whether or not there are differences between men and women. Surprise, yes, there are. Bigger surprise, yes, there are even in the models of treatment. And so in the current reboot study, it's a, it's a male model of Gulf War illness. So it's a men's study. Um, but we have another model for women that we're just submitting actually this week again for, um, for funding to try to move the female model into clinical trials as soon as we can. And she, that's being submitted as a VA merit um, in the next few days. So that's exciting.
And so uh, we have this study going on. Now this woman's study that we've been doing, uh, it, it's a really cool study. We did it with men. This is what gave us this amazing reboot model that we're, we're, we're testing. And then we redid the whole study again for women. The only thing we need now in the women's study is more female controls in their 50s and 60s that are willing to come in and have bloods drawn during a bicycle ride so that we can get a better normative data for the female model. We have pretty much what we need um, in, the, in the men's model. It's done and we already moved all the way into through the mice and all the way into human trial. And we're on our second male human trial, but we have not yet been able to move the women's study uh, forward to, to clinical trial. We still need a few more um, controls. So if you're in the South Florida area and you have some women friends that they don't have to have been deployed. They just have to be of the same age and veterans. It would be great if you might encourage them to volunteer for these studies and help us better understand the differences between healthy and sick in, um, in these illnesses. Um, and then speaking of women, uh, Lou Bob Nathanson has spent a lot of time trying to work out um, the female models of this illness uh, at a genetic level at which genes are being turned on and off and what's regulating them. And she's doing some great work. She's really stretched to find uh, the study subjects. And if again, any woman veteran goes to any of the bee brain sites, you'll be hearing more about that. Um, we would have better access to the samples that we need. Of course, we're recruiting men and women for bee brain in South Florida. This is a biorepository that, that feeds the research all over the country, many, many investigators. And uh, if we could just get more women to volunteer for that study, we would have a lot more answers for the women veterans that were there and are suffering. So I, I alluded to this reboot study where we're um, trying to um, understand homeostasis. And I've told you that we've finished in the men's study all the work we need to understand the model and pushed it through the animal model. We cured a bunch of mice, cured. Did I use the word cure? Oh, yes, I did. I used the word cure. We cured the mice of their Gulf War illness, even though they were the equivalent of chronically ill, 10 years ill in this model of the mouse. Um, using the drugs that we are now using in a clinical trial um, for Gulf War illness. We just finished our first little phase one study on this um, and uh, trying to use the lowest possible doses of these two drugs uh, together in the lowest amount. Now we've moved it into a second phase where we're using the medication for three months instead of one month. And um, it's a study where we, we basically reduced brain inflammation with one medicine for three months. And then we reboot the neuroendocrine pathways with a different medicine for one week. And then we step back and watch and see what happens over the next um, four months. So it's a really cool study. We're recruiting it right now. And I mean, we really need study subjects because this study was delayed because of COVID. The second, the second study, the one that we're recruiting right now, um, we had to wait until uh, vaccines were widely available before we could initiate a study that reduces inflammation. We were worrying, of course, that um, if we did that during COVID, that we might, might pe put people at greater risk for a more serious infection. And so we had to wait until people were vaccinated before we could restart the study. And now everyone's vaccinated. And now we're at a really good spot uh, with COVID where the variants are not as severe. And we are uh, very excited to be back in the saddle and, and getting these studies together. That that delay cost us a lot. We are funded to do a phase one and a phase two. That means we're funded to get this from this little study that proves the point and picks the right dose to the great big study that's a multi-center study across the whole country. And we're funded to do that right now, but we have to finish the entire lot, get it all done in the next two years. That means we have to fully recruit this phase one study in just in the next couple months at best, I mean, ideally in the next few weeks so that we could have all that data, that six months of data all analyzed by the fall and institute our phase two study before the end of the year. And uh, that is our goal. It's a really ambitious goal. It's gonna be really hard to get that phase two study done if this phase one isn't recruited almost immediately. We need 17 people. So think about that. We do have some 
not tons of travel money, but we have some travel money to support that. And we are doing the study in South Florida. Like I say, this is our moonshot, go for the cure study where, where we are very, very excited. The most exciting thing I've ever done in my entire career is this study. So I would really um, hope that y'all hear me say, please volunteer for this study. We need, we need study subjects. Um, well, another thing that we do, and this is really important for you to hear, I told you before that we have to narrow sometimes the, the case definition to be able to do good work, but we're really cognizant that, that it's not true that people, the military, the veterans often come out of service with more than one thing going on. Sometimes they have PTSD, sometimes they have TBI, sometimes they have Gulf War illness, sometimes they have depression, they have all these different kinds of things going on. And you don't wanna to do a study that's so narrow that you can't generalize and help everybody or as many people as you can. And so we don't really want to overdo that. Instead, we, we, we just acknowledge it's complicated, really, really complicated. And thus you need supercomputing, hotshot, amazing scientists like, like Dr. Craddock and Dr. Broderick that have done these amazing computational modeling work in, in, in the field. And right now, Dr. Craddock has just completing and, and, and has another study underway that's really teasing out PTSD, TBI, depression, men, women, all the different um, subgroups, if you would, to try to get models of treatment that makes really good sense for the individual. And hopefully it's gonna to get to the point where you can model it down to a, a single individual, where you can put in all the complexities and as much knowledge as you have and let the supercomputer drive uh, answers that um, seem very sci-fi, but oh my goodness, it's true. And it's really doing amazing things. And you can see that here's Dr. Kranich's um, um, different studies that he has underway. And he's got studies for TBI, he's got studies for PT PTSD. He's looking at men versus women, women with and without PTSD. He got a paper out today on women with PTSD that said, that while the PTSD is um, really enters into the complexity of the illness and actually um, changes the way we, we sort of analyze a model that you cannot explain Gulf War illness on any kind of mood or anxiety or PTSD overlay that Gulf War illness is an entity in and of its own right. So that's a really important um, thing, observation. And, and uh, we knew that it's going to matter to the men and women with Gulf War illness that they're see the illness as not something that is um, psychiatric per se, if you would, but rather something that is um, even deeper rooted than, than that. This is the reboot study that I was talking about that we need 17 people right now, right now, call this number right now. We really, really need to recruit this study in order to be able to deliver the goods for you. And like I say, this is our moonshot go for the cure study. And um, we couldn't be more excited about the potential of this study. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna whip through this part, but this is to say in the, that in, when you're dealing with studies that are, um, is, or with illnesses as complicated as Gulf War illness, you, you can't get your too narrow a view. You can't say, oh, this is a brain illness or that this is a, a, a immune system illness or that this is a endocrine illness because it's all of that. And, and those systems lean heavily into and on each other. And until you try to understand this illness as homeostasis, the way these illnesses interact and balance each other, you really can't get at the answers. And so when the, the um, Dr. Craddock and his team look at the different types of um, modeling of this illness, um, and they're trying to say that when you're healthy, all these illnesses sort of are in a balance and your, your, your body is in this little well here. When you're sick, you crawl up this wall here, but you always roll back into wellness. But something magical happened during a golf wellness, something magically bad that rolled you up over this mountain and rolled you into this other well. So now you're in a different space and now you're balanced there and you crawl up the well, you almost get better, you crawl back down, boom, slam down, or you get sick with the flu, you get sicker, even sicker, but then you get fall back into your old, but now sick chronic balance. So what this um, moonshot is, was using the supercomputer 
to find ways to crawl up the right mountain and fall back into the right hole of wellness. That would be, that's the best way I can describe it. And to do so, you had to push more than one button. You couldn't just make the endocrine system better or adjust the immune system better. You had to push multiple buttons in the right order to, to basically reboot the system back into its balance. And so they did, you know, using supercomputing platforms, hundreds of thousands of trials in silico, in the computer, in every kind of combination, at every kind of dose, hitting every kind of button, and trying to create this complex model that was developed into this rebooted model of normal. And it basically, um, it resulted in this first design, the one that we're testing now, and the one that cured all those mice, which was that we had to reduce brain inflammation with a specific type of drug, and then block the adrenal gland briefly so that the adrenal gland screamed out to the brain to turn back on and produce the signaling that would normally drive a normal adrenal function and then release it by taking that drug away, sort of like, like you know, revving your engine and then taking the chucks away from the, from the wheel. So you're just speeding out and then um, rebooting the normal adrenal axis. And that's what um, we believe we can do in our first study, the lower dose, lower exposure study, we almost got there, we were, we were close. We moved the needle in the, in the predicted and right direction and people did feel better but we didn't quite cure them. So now we're doing this second study where we're hoping that we can take it all the way. So this was the deal. We put people on these bikes and measured everything. A whole lot of bloods were drawn in, in rapid succession so we could understand what relapse was being driven by. Gave all that data to the guys in the supercomputing. Okay, so the two quick things I wanted to say, I don't know why that cut off my slides when I was talking. Two important things. The Gulf War Illness Clinical Trials Consortia is an ongoing effort. It's a national consortia. It's got multiple sites and we're just kicking off the studies. We had a very long COVID delay. And I think that you're gonna hear this theme a lot. And perhaps as people that have been involved in our clinical trials, you just don't know what COVID did to research in this country, not to Gulf War Illness per se, but to all research. We all got put on a hard stop when COVID hit this country, the pandemic, because it was considered risky to even bring you into our sites to, it was your hospital-based sites to, um, to be evaluated. So now finally after vaccinations and after this pandemic has run much of its course, let's pray, the, um, we're back up and running and things are going again. And we're so anxious not to lose any ground and lose the momentum that we had. It was so important that you, the, vet, the, the veterans who've been waiting with, you know, impatiently, appropriately so, for answers need to know that we're on this and that this is going forward. And so the Gulf Wellness Clinical Trials Consortia has one study up. It's that reboot study I was referring to. We need to recruit it. Please volunteer. We're going to be starting a second study that's entirely virtual. So it's got a nat national uh, reach. People who are nowhere near our sites can participate in that study. It's going to be the Bacopa study. Then there's another study called the NAC study, the N-acetylcysteine study, which is all about that oxidative stress stuff I was talking about. That study is going to be um, also national with a national reach, but with regional um, emphasis because some of the sites will be doing imaging. So that's very exciting. So all this stuff is going on and you need to hear about it. And of course, the consortium is also supporting a number of other trials. Um, and I don't have time to review it all with you, but I, but I do want to uh, make sure that you are aware of it. Um, sorry. Um, and the B cell depletion study I mentioned ever so briefly, but this one we aren't allowed to do because of COVID, the drug that we would have used would have put people at risk. So instead we switched it to an IV gamma globulin treatment to reduce autoantibodies. This study is finally approved, ready to go up and running, very exciting for people that have autoantibodies that are targeting their brain. And we have a screening tool for that. This was the heels of Kim Sullivan's study that demonstrated that these autoantibodies exist. And this study will tell us whether or not suppressing them helps people. It's a really important study. So um, we have a lot going on there in the trial that, this is my last slide I wanna, my next last slide show. 
the uh, project in depth. Uh, really important you hear about this. This is, this is an amazing study. It took us three years, four maybe, to get this whole thing working. But this is a VA NIH partnership where the VA is reaching out to Gulf War veterans to recruit them into this study. We're starting from the people that have done some of those surveys that have been going on for years now, particularly the surveys that were happening every five years after uh, the Gulf War. So uh, there are, uh, I think, 20 or 30,000 veterans that have participated in that study. Then there's several other survey studies um, that are out there that we've also been recruiting from and bringing, uh, doing a lot of review virtually and then bringing some people into VAs to, to dig a little deeper. If they're okay to go forward with a study, and this, is, this study has a very broad definition of Gulf War illness. We really want to understand, understand it uh, in, its, in its true form. It's not too narrowly defined in terms of case definition. But if you're really looking good and you're willing to go forward, 50 lucky veterans will go to the uh, NIH, the hospital that's there on the NIH campus, it's just for research and basically spend about two weeks in this facility having every known study ever designed and some that are brand brand spanking new to uh, what's called a deep phenotyping, really getting into the deepest, deepest possible understanding of what's going on in those people. And then 25 healthy controls. And honestly, I think they're gonna be the hardest to recruit. So, um, but I do think this is so exciting. And then again, they'll be using this kind of computational modeling that I described that our group does to, um, with even more information than we've ever been able to glean from our, what we thought were in-depth studies um, to really fill in those models and, and get us to the point of having uh, targeted therapies that are based on the best that science has to offer. And this is my final slide. This is just a slide that if you wanted to hit that link, I'll put it into the chat. In fact, I think I already did, but I'll do it again. Um, this is a way to just sign up on an easy kind of platform with about a 30 minute questionnaire about who you are, how you are, how sick you are, and that you're willing to be contacted for future studies. So it's, so it's a way for us to be allowed to reach out to you and tell you about the studies we have, keep you in the know with newsletters and things that we put out to you so that you're, you're well aware. This is, again, we use it not just for our studies, but for all this, any investigator that wants to, to help, uh, help us help them find their studies patients. Um, we put out the, as much as we possibly can to the people that are volunteering through this site. And so this is super helpful to us to be able to find you. There's so many uh, regulations that prevent us from being allowed to um, do that um, without your permission. So this is a way for you to give us permission. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Let me get out of the share screen. There we go. Our next speaker is Dr. Kimberly Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is an associate research professor at Boston University School of Public Health Department of Environmental Health and the former Associate Scientific Director for the VA Research Advisory Committee on Gulf War Veterans Illnesses. Dr. Sullivan co-chaired the Joint VA-DOD Common Data Elements Working Groups for Gulf War Illness and currently serves on multiple VA Executive Advisory Committees for Gulf War Illness Research. She is a behavioral neuroscientist and the former principal investigator on the large multi-site Gulf War Illness Consortia that included GWIC that included nine study sites and was designed to determine pa the pathobiology of Gulf War illness. She is currently the PI and director of the large multi-site Boston Biorepository and Integrative Network for Gulf War illness, B-Brain, that was designed to share biospecimens and foster collaboration among GWI researchers. She has received multiple honors for her work with veterans, including the Boston University Center for Military Health Soaring Eagle Award. I will now hand it over to you, Dr. Sullivan. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen to share here. Can you see that? Okay. Um, can you see my screen? I just want to make sure that it's showing. Yes. 
Okay, great, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you today. And I'm going to be talking about two consortia that I've run over the years um, that Sarah mentioned. So first is the Boston Gulf War Illness Consortium. And the second is the Bee Brain Repository Network. And they're both examples of how the research community is really working together to develop diagnostic markers and treatments for Gulf War illness. And we've heard over and over, uh, over the years from our veterans that we should be working together to solve these issues. And we couldn't agree more. And so I wanna tell you our progress to date by doing that, by working together. I'm just trying to move my slides here, let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, I, I want to first um, make sure that we acknowledge that this is the 31st anniversary of the Gulf War this week. I know all of you are aware of that, but I also want to thank you all for your service um, during the Gulf War, all of you veterans who, who are on today. Um, we thank you for your service and, and, and your sacrifices. Um, just to give you a little overview of the Gulf War Illness Consortium. So this was designed to identify diagnostic markers and to develop treatments for Gulf War illness by working together to speed the progress of our research. And we had 10 study sites around the country and we had preclinical, so animal and cell researchers working together hand in hand with, with our clinical researchers who work with our, our, our veterans. Um, and, and the idea of that was to speed things up to make the research um, happen faster. Um, and as you can see here, we, um, this is just one of the pictures from one of our annual meetings. You'll recognize a lot of these faces. So Dr. Klimas, uh, Dr. Steele, among others. Um, and, and this was a really great team approach in terms of trying to develop um, treatments and diagnostic markers faster. So how did we do? So in terms of some of our key research accomplishments from the uh, consortia, um, the GWIC consortia and our follow-on studies, um, we had key research, research accomplishments, including the results of brain imaging, where we were the first to show inflammation in the brains of veterans with Gulf War illness by using PET imaging radio tracers of a protein called TSPO, which are located on the glial cells within the brain, as you can see on, on the right-hand side here. Um, so the brain has neurons and lots of glial cells. Um, and you can see the figure below, which shows the TSPO PET ligand has been activated in veterans with Gulf War illness compared with healthy controls here in the, the red and the yellow. And basically you can see it's lighting up like a Christmas tree. So we're really seeing very clearly neuroinflammation in the brains of our veterans with Gulf War illness. And we've now been funded for several new brain imaging studies of PET imaging and machine learning, where we will tease out which types of glial cells are causing this brain inflammation. And why is that important? It's important because this will allow for a treatment development pipeline with strategic targets with already FDA approved drugs. Of course, we wanna use already FDA approved drugs so that we can get these treatments to our veterans faster. We don't wanna be in the place where we're developing treatments um, that take a long time to, to, to get out to the market. So these are repurposed FDA drugs that are already available depending on the next results of which type of glia that we, we see are activated. So what about other results. So um, we've also found that results of two of our ongoing studies are very promising as objective diagnostic tests for Gulf War illness. So first, when we looked at brain imaging markers of white matter glial changes in the brain, we found a 94% accuracy in classifying veterans with Gulf War illness. And when we looked at blood tests of central nervous system proteins that at some point leaked through the blood brain barrier, we found that veterans with Gulf War illness had much higher levels of these autoantibodies, including things such as tau proteins in their blood than healthy veterans or individuals with similar types of disorders such as chronic fatigue syndrome or irritable bowel syndrome. And when we added these autoantibody scores into a combined index score, we found that 90% of veterans with Gulf War illness scored above a, a level of 30, indicating a potential simple blood diagnostic test for Gulf War illness. Uh, lastly, we found that levels of the chemical messenger glutamate and pro-inflammatory cytokines were significantly higher in the blood of veterans with Gulf War illness than our healthy veterans. So collectively, these results suggest strong targets for Gulf War illness based on central nervous system changes, and that a simple diagnostic test is well within reach. Um, and these are also FDA, there are also FDA approved drugs and supplements available for these central nervous system targets as well. So um, 
In terms of the consortium, so for the GWIC consortium, we actually ended up um, with 40 publications that came from the consortium and two additional consortia that got funded from it. And one of them is the B-Brain repository network. Um, and the other one is the GWIC-TIC that you heard about from Dr. Klimas. Um, in addition to that, um, Dr. Klimas mentioned, so we had a small biorepository as part of the GWIC studies. And we actually were able to provide samples and data to 20 additional studies just from the small GWIC consortia. Um, and so we wanted to build on that. And we then got funding for the Boston Biorepository and Integrative Network for Gulf War Illness, or B-Brain. And so B-Brain is a example of a resource developed specifically to encourage collaboration and speed the process of scientific discovery. Uh, but it also serves as an important source to validate samples, which is equally important for a biorepository. There are lots of studies that have, been, uh, that have come out that have small sample sizes, for example, um, and need to be validated in larger samples. So this is the, the uh, ability for us to now do that. Um, and B-Brain is really designed to be a, a, a conduit for scientific collaborations within the Gulf War illness research community that builds upon the GWIC and, and makes it even larger. Um, and so just due to the highly successful research collaborations from the GWIC, we thought that natural next step would be to increase this highly valuable resource by replenishing the GWIC samples and increasing our diagnostic and treatment capabilities by including investigators from additional study sites around the country. So we have eight additional study sites now within, within the B-Brain repository network. So we heard you, your, your, your thoughts to us and, and we heard our veterans telling us to work together and we are doing just that. So B-Brain now is serving as a core resource for, for current and future biomarker studies. So it's, we have established an infrastructure um, through the B-Brain, which is providing much needed repository samples and data mining from other studies to be successful in biomarker and translational studies. Um, so why is that important? So uh, we, we are taking information that is being shared with us from other studies and data mining, um, putting them together with other data to see um, if, if we have more power to see these biomarkers and potential for, for treatment development. And we have a strong track record of translating these biomarkers from animal and cell studies to the clinic and B-Brain is building upon this expertise. So in this way, B-Brain and GWIC-TIC are working hand in hand to provide the infrastructure for biomarker development and targeted treatment trials. Um, CDMRP funded us for both of these trials, uh, both of these uh, consortia, um, and they gave the option for other studies to share samples with B-Brain and for other studies to request samples for B-Brain for their studies. And we're actually doing just that right now. So we're actively getting samples from other studies and we're sharing samples and data. So other studies, for example, if they've got a three-year funded study, they don't have to wait two and a half out of the three years because they're collecting all this their um, data um, that we can actually give them their samples much sooner than that and they can start doing their analyses much more quickly. So we're really trying to speed up this process of, of biomarker and treatment development. And B-Brain has developed a menu of available samples and data that investigators can request on our website. And that is available to our, uh, that will be sent to our steering committee for approval of samples and data sharing. And that's really important um, that we make sure that um, these requests are appropriate, that, that, that they're related to Gulf War illness um, and, and that they are appropriate for the use of these very valuable samples that our veterans are sharing with us. Um, this is a little menu of the biorepository, so the B-Brain repository um, data and samples that are available. So we are currently collecting blood, plasma, serum, saliva, stool samples, and urine samples uh, from 500 Gulf War veterans, as well as demographic surveys and cognitive test data. We also have brain imaging that, that is available within the repository network that we are sharing with others. Um, this is the contact information for us. Um, and, and we're actively sharing uh, as we're getting this data. But we need more in people to, to participate in our studies to, to get the samples that we need to share with others within this network. Um, in terms of uh, request form for investigators, so investigators can request samples and data with this simple online form um, that is reviewed and approved by a steering committee and our Gulf War advisory members. Um, and again, we make sure that these are appropriate requests of your very valuable samples and data. Um, this is a um, publication of uh, 
that just came out in Life Sciences, special issue one go for illness. And it describes all of the data and samples available within the biorepository network uh, for bee brain. Uh, and it also describes that we've recently added COVID-19 questions to our uh, demographic and, and surveys as well, because we've had a lot of questions about that from, from veterans. And so we're trying to address that as well. So we're able to adjust as we go as well to, to add things to surveys as things come up like a pandemic. Uh, in terms of additional things that we're doing, one of the things we thought was very important um, is the common data elements uh, within our field. Um, so we worked with Dr. Klimas's group, um, and this was funded by VA and, and, the, and the Department of Defense. Um, and we actually had some workshops where we worked as a, a team of researchers um, looking at Gulf War illness common data elements and making recommendations for those. So what does that mean? So these are common core tests that we recommend that all studies use. Uh, at least these, they can add additional ones, but we, we would like them to use one core set of, of uh, test methods. And the reason for that is because then we can compare across studies uh, in, in a way that makes sense. So we're comparing apples to apples on you know, biomarker or treatment trial studies rather than apples to oranges if, if, if people use different tests for each of their studies. Um, so we think this is very, very important in moving the field forward. And we've published on these common data elements now um, in that life sciences special issue I just mentioned um, with Cohen et al. That's freely available for anybody who would like to take a look at that. Um, and we also have published on cognitive outcome common data elements, so cognitive tests that also are very important because a lot of cognitive tests are being used for some of the treatment trials. So we want to make sure we can compare the outcomes as a apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. Um, we have plans for additional um, common data element publications. And so one area we'd like to be focusing on is exposure outcomes. So Dr. Klimas mentioned, you know, some of these exposures that we've been doing studies on for many years. Um, Things such as, you know, hearing chemical weapons, being exposed to sar low-level sarin from the Camasia weapons depot detonations, those pyridostigmine bromide anti-nerve gas pills, um, pesticides. We know these are associated with Gulf War illness, and we would like to, to have common data elements where the studies uh, are asking these um, uh, exposure questions the same way, so that then we can compare across studies and we can data mine by putting these um, the the results of the studies together eventually and, and have more power to see um, different outcomes in, in different biomarker studies. So that's something you'll be seeing soon. We hope we'll have hope to have this published, but that's what we're working on in terms of common data elements at the moment. So what about our results from our prior study? So we're, we're doing some data mining now from the bee brain um, prior studies that uh, our collaborators have shared with us. And I just wanted to give you some sense of um, what it's looking like in terms of the different uh, functional areas that our veterans have been having trouble with over the years. So for example, um, if on the left-hand side here, these are the survey instruments. So the, one, the first one is the multidimensional fatigue inventory. So this was recommended in the common data elements. Um, and we've now combined data from our B brain uh, uh, re retrospective studies. And now we have over 300 um, uh, veterans um, answering this question. And we see in fact that for, for this survey, this validated survey, that our veterans with Gulf War illness um, report much higher fatigue on this scale than our veteran controls. Again, the same thing for this um, pain scale called the McGill, we see the same thing. Our veterans with Gulf War illness are showing much higher um, uh, report of pain on this than our healthy controls. Same thing for the PSQI, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. Um, and we also see it on several cognitive test outcomes. So on verbal memory, so a, a measure called the California Verbal Learning Test. We see the same thing. So all of these things were recommended in the common data elements, and we are now able to validate them with the B-Brain retrospective data that we will hope to publish shortly. So we just want to show what's coming from this data that our, our veterans um, have shared with us um, and that our research teams are now pooling together so we can validate these common data elements and say which of these measures should be used in, in future and current biomarker and treatment trials. So this is the organizational structure for B-Brain. As you can see, we have our steering committee, we have our, our uh, prior study, so our retrospective um, studies uh, who are sharing this data that I, some of the data I just showed you, as well as samples. Um, and we are doing new recruitment at four study sites around the country. So this is in Boston, 
at the Miami VA and Nova Southeastern University, at the Bronx VA and the San Francisco VA. And this is a one day study where we're trying to recruit 500 uh, veterans for our new study, for, for this newer recruitment for B-Brain. So then we can share this with all of the rest of the researchers in our community. And again, this is to speed up the, the, the results of our, our biomarker and treatment trial. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of what we have so far in terms of our demographic outcomes for B-Brain, this is in the new recruitment. You know, we're trying to get to that 500 mark. We're at about 115 or so recruited so far. So we're getting there, and especially during the middle of uh, you know this pandemic, we were I think we, we're doing as well as we can, but we need more participants. You know, we we'd really like to get to that 500 mark as quickly as possible. Um, I will show you in terms of our, uh, our outcome for our for our veterans who have Gulf War illness and, and our healthy controls. The breakdown of age and gender and race is pretty similar, so we're doing pretty well there. However, in terms of the breakdown of, of women veterans, we have about 13% right now. We'd really like to do better on that. Um, we have a lot of um, questions about uh, whether women veterans look different than, than our male veterans um, on, on a lot of our Gulf War illness and other outcomes. So we'd really like to get more women veterans. So if you're out there and you're listening today, we'd really love to have you come and do our study. Um, what else are we seeing? So in terms of health outcomes from the B-Brain um, study so far, as I mentioned, we are starting to collect information on COVID-19. So we do know who's tested positive and who hasn't, um, at least as much as our veterans know that on their surveys, um, and who's also gotten the vaccine. So we can actually provide this data to researchers who are interested in looking at that. Uh, we also, as I, as I mentioned before, we, we have these common data elements that we're trying to validate. So those, that fatigue scale continues to be um, something that we're seeing that's higher in our veterans with Gulf War illness versus our, our healthy controls, the pain scale, as well as the sleep measures. Um, so we are able to, again, with our newer uh, uh, study participants showing that these scales are, are, are uh, sensitive and specific to, to, to Gulf War illness in that respect that you know, we are able to validate them and, and they uh, uh, will stay in the common data elements. Um, this is our website for the B brain. Um, and our contact information, so our email and telephone number, our uh, website. We also have a very active social media page, we, and we'd love to have a look at that. We put up everything that we're doing on our social media accounts, including publications that we try to make freely available. Uh, if there's anything on there that you would like to get, that please contact us, and we'd be happy to share that with you. We want our veterans to see what's coming from from this research and from your time and coming to do this for us. So we very much appreciate that. So what are our future directions? So what we'd like to do is validate our prior blood and brain imaging diagnostic markers of Gulf War illness that I already mentioned. Um, so we're actively doing that in ongoing studies. Uh, we'd like to identify objective biomarkers of Gulf War illness with that tau protein that I mentioned and other those central nervous system autoantibodies in the blood. Um, as well as blood markers of that excitatory transmitter glutamate and inflammatory pro-inflammatory uh, pro cytokine markers as well. Um, and that gets us toward closer towards a diagnostic test for Gulf War illness, a simple blood test, we hope. Um, and we're also focusing on these markers for current and, treat, uh, and planned treatment trials. Um, and we're working hand in hand with GWICTIC for that. And so some of the things you'll be seeing coming down the line is a much larger um, study of low glutamate diet um, with Dr. Holton. So we're going to have a multi-site trial of that coming in the fall. We're also um, studying supplements, Bacopa and N-acetylcysteine, which you'll we'll be hearing about in the very near future. Um, other future studies that we are currently funded for that we'll be studying in the very near future, um, one of them is called the new B-Brain study. So this is called the non-exclusionary wave study, which will give a uh, more veterans a chance to participate in research studies. So in the past, we've tried to keep our, our case criteria pretty tight, and we sometimes have to exclude veterans who have Gulf War illness, but other conditions as well, these other comorbid conditions. So this new study will include veterans who have Gulf War illness and a lot of those uh, other comorbid conditions. And we, we are doing that so that we can try and see if veterans with Gulf War illness also develop some of these conditions later, or if Gulf War veterans with Gulf War illness who don't have these conditions look, look similar or different than those who do have these other conditions. So we're very excited to start that um, study in the fall. So if you have been not able to participate in some of our prior studies, please do reach out to us because you may well be 
um, able to participate in this newbie brain study. We also have a study of tau markers, those tau proteins I was telling you about. We will do pet brain imaging and blood testing for these tau proteins. And we also have several studies of uh, Gulf War women where we now have funded uh, to look at reproductive health outcomes. And this one will be starting again um, in the fall. Uh, again, there's been so many questions about reproductive health outcomes comes and we really didn't have enough data to answer that properly and we hope to be able to start addressing those questions with this new study. We also have a practitioner's grant. So this is study to identify gaps in patient provider communication and to improve care for our veterans with Gulf War illness. So we've heard again and again our veterans telling us, you know, I go to my primary care provider, whether it's VA or outside, you know, a private, um, and they just don't know anything about Gulf War illness and, and they don't know how to treat me with my illness. And so this is a grant specifically designed to improve that by working with practitioners. So that will be coming down the line shortly as well. Um, with that, I wanna thank all of the veterans who have participated in our studies uh, currently and over the years. Um, none of this progress would have been made possible without you willing to come and do these studies for us. So we don't take that for granted and we're very, very thankful for your time. Um, and willingness to, to stick with us and to participate in our studies. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan, for the update on bee brain and your presentation on the common data elements for Gulf War illness. Our next speaker is Zachary Barnes. Um, Zach has spent the last 14 years working with Dr. Nancy Klimas's research enterprise in a variety of roles covering clinical research recruitment, laboratory coordination, and data management and analytics. He is currently leading the recruitment efforts for the Gulf War Illness Studies at the Miami VA Medical Center under the direction of Clinical Operation Nurse Executive Fanny Collado. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Zach. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Great. So. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So just what I want to kind of talk about here is what happens when you decide you want to participate in research? What could you expect, right? One of the things we're trying to be better at is being more informative of the process, being more upfront about expectations, because, you know, I, I've seen in the chat, it's it's frustrating. And I hear that frustration. Uh, we all do. And, and it's not OK. So this is the way we're trying to fix it, right? Um, when you call us, when you reach out to us, uh, the first thing that you have to understand is that we're going to take extreme steps to protect your information, right? Because your information is, is private, it's yours. Um, we want to make sure nothing happens to it, right? So the first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be reaching back out to you and giving you some information that, that you're seeking, right? Uh, let's say you call, um, you call this, uh, the VA number or the VHA uh, email the VHA MIA GWI at VA.gov. Um, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a call from one of the recruitment team members, uh, one of the one of the clinical coordinators, um, and they're going to they're going to try to provide you with the information that you're seeking. If you're interested in participating in the clinical trial, they're going to give you the information about that clinical trial, what's involved, um, but they're also going to tell you about other studies that might be available to you. And the reason is because uh, some of those studies may may require much less that you can't be involved in when you're on a clinical trial. So logistically, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the best fit for you, right? Um, now, you know, not just what is involved, uh, what time is, is involved, right? What level of effort? Do you have to come into a physical location? Is it something that could be done from the comfort of your home? Is it, a, is it something that's strictly online or is, it, or is it something that could be done virtually? We just started a number of virtual clinical trials. Um, so we're also explaining uh, at, that, at that first stage, the risk, right? Um, what risks might be involved? Um, and the reason we do that is we wanna make sure that the information is out there, like I said, that we're upfront, and more importantly, that you're comfortable with proceeding. No one in any recruitment role should be trying to convince you of anything, right? That's, that's the number one thing we're taught. That's the number one thing that we hammer on, right? We are here to help. We are here to provide information. We want you to understand what the research is about and then encourage you to participate, but only if that's something that you're willing to do. It is participation. It is not, it is not required. Um, the next thing that's going to be happening is you're going to be 
uh, having a more detailed conversation about your medical history, about any medications you might be taking, um, any symptom information that, that we need to gather, uh, as well as service information. Um, we're gonna be talking about any existing conditions that you might have. Um, and then some of those conversations may seem general, other times they may seem extremely specific. Um, and the reason is, is that, is that uh, for some of the clinical trials, there are certain uh, things that, that you, you might have, uh, you know, gallstones, uh, a history of gallstones would indicate that you can't participate in the glutathione curcumin clinical trial just because of some of the side effects of that medication. Um, so being honest and upfront about that, we certainly appreciate it because at the end of the day, it, what we're doing is we're saving time and that time is yours. We wanna protect your time. You already, you've already done so much for us uh, by, by serving your country. You've already done so much for us by participating in any past research. We don't, we don't wanna waste your time, right? Um, so the next thing that would then happen is the consent process, right? That, that in that in-person visit, and again, this usually is happening in person, um, but if it's a virtual trial, then it would happen on the phone with, a, with one of our nurse coordinators. Um, uh, should you be eligible based on your pre-screening information, uh, you go into what's called the consent process where you're understanding the risks, you're understanding uh, what the process is in detail, uh, and you're agreeing to participate um, while knowing that at any time you can say, no, this is not what I'm interested in, right? What, we're, what, what that process is, is it's, it's protecting your rights as a participant. Now, um, we do get, and I know that the other speakers have touched on this before, there is frustration when, you, when you're not eligible to participate in something um, due to, due to a, a, uh, a, an existing condition, due to not being the right age um, or, or um, gender, that, that'll happen uh, for that particular study. Um, what we're trying to be more upfront about is what other opportunities are out there. Um, obviously, I recruit for Dr. Klimas' studies and Dr. Sullivan's studies and some of the other investigators that you're gonna hear from today. Um, I want you to participate in our studies. That said, if you can, I'm, I'm more than happy to give you any information I have to participate in other people's studies. Because if you're interested in doing research, if it, it's about fit, it's about what's right for you. Um, so so uh, once you're scheduled for the in-person appointment, or the virtual appointment. Once you um, come in, you're gonna receive that consent. That's the first thing that's going to happen. Once you've been consented, then you're gonna in, in enter into what's called the screening and enrollment process. Um, that's, that's what we call a final check, right? We're trying to take a very detailed look at what specific requirements the study has for entry, what specific uh, what specific uh, uh, exclusion criteria exist so that, again, before bringing you in, before bringing you into the door to do any sort of intervention, before, um, before having to do the, the bulk of the work for the project, we make certain that, that you're eligible, right? Um, we want to make sure to answer these, these, research, these important research questions. We want to answer the questions about whether tr potential treatments are going to work. And the only way that we could do that is, with, is by being thorough. Now, once we do all that, once you, once you pass through the screening process, then you're in the study, you're enrolled. Um, you, conduct, you, know, you conduct all of your questionnaires, any blood work that might be involved. Um, once that happens and you've completed that process, we actually are gonna reach back out to you because we wanna know how it went. We wanna see where we can improve. We wanna see uh, did, were there any hiccups in the process? Because obviously that happens and we want to be better. Um, our work isn't done. And obviously it's not going to be done until, until we get things moved a lot further forward. Um, and, and everyone that served and continues to serve by participating in research, really, uh, we, thank, we thank you for your service because without you, we can't get the job done. Um, so when we do talk to you about feedback, we want, we want your honest feedback. We, because we, you know, we want to be first of all there to hear your your concerns, but also to make it better and to fix it. So, um, with that said, uh, I'll turn it back over to Sarah to uh, to move to move on. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Zach, for explaining the recruitment process to um, folks listening. Our next speaker I would like to introduce is Dr. Layla Abdullah. 
Dr. Abdullah is a senior scientist at the Ross Camp Institute and directs the neuroscience lipid research. She has over 15 years of experience in clinical and basic science research, particularly in the field of Gulf War illness. Dr. Abdullah received a Master of Science in Epidemiology from the University of London, UK, and a PhD from the Open University. Since her graduation, Dr. Abdullah has been working in the field of lipid metabolism and bioenergetics in order to identify avenues for intervention that can help improve health and well-being of veterans with Gulf War illness. In that regard, Dr. Abdullah, with her research team at the Ross Camp Institute, has been working on dietary supplementation strategies to determine if they have been helpful in restoring mitochondrial bioenergetics and help improve general well-being of of veterans with Gulf War illness. The team will start their pilot research work with nicotinamide riboside to see if blood biomarkers of mitochondrial energy metabolism change with NR supplementation and whether this corresponds with improvements in general health of veterans with Gulf War illness. I will now hand it over to you, Dr. Abdullah. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna um, get my presentation online here. Is everybody able to see the presentation? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting. And this is, it's my pleasure to be able to present our work, our Ross Camp Institute's research work. We've been working for well over two, um, almost two decades now, trying to develop strategies that can help improve the general health and well being of veterans with Gulf War illness. And it's really exciting to get to the stage where we're testing some of the things that we discovered in the, in the lab from our basic translational studies, um, basic science studies to these translational clinical pilot studies. Um, I, I won't um, get into the too much detail. As you're all aware, um, we, we are quite concerned about the ongoing issues that the veterans with, this, with Gulf War illness are suffering from, um, chronic fatigue, memory problems, and widespread pain and we're focusing on these key symptoms. Um, and we basically some of the, the, the work that came into existence based from our animal models, uh, we focused on pesticides primarily in conjunction with protostigmine bromide, the anti-nerve agent, to see how it affects the, the whole, the brain and the body. And we focused on pesticide primarily because we know that um, it has the ability to hide in the body, in the body fat, and that it can, and because the brain has so much fat, it can enter the brain as well. And it can then disturb how the, the fat that are needed for the brain, and it can disturb how it's being used. So we focused on, um, on a number of issues that are relevant to brain health, which is insulation of the nerves, um, omega-3 fatty acids, which are basically energy stores and uh, control the inflammation in the brain, um, and then the energy source, which is the mitochondria component, and you know how it produces um, energy resources for the brain. So going back to the mouse model, our earlier I did my PhD um, on Gulf War illness. So um, I basically, as part of my PhD pr um, project, I developed a mouse model looking at pesticide exposure and to see how um, it affected the brain health. So we used a combination of protostigmine bromide and, um, and pesticides permethrin primarily. And the PhD was funded by CDMRP. Um, so basically based on these primary preliminary uh, project studies, we determined that um, when we look at the, the brain health of the mice that received the Gulf War chemicals compared to the ones that didn't. When we look at the brain, we see a lot of inflammation. Um, and when we look at the, you know, the, the presentation of these mice in terms of when they're tested, they present with fatigue, they present with memory problems, they present with brain inflammation. So I'll point out here. So we look focused on two different brain regions. We focus, focused on the cortex and the hippocampus. And what we see in our in our mice is that whenever they were given Gulf War illness, and this is looking at, you know, about 16 months after the exposure. So this really represents a chronic condition um, that are probably relevant to Gulf War veterans. 
And so when we look, so if you see these red dots, they are activated um, microglia, which are involved in inflammation and promoting inflammation in the brain. So you can see that compared to the control mice, the ones that display um, the, the ones that have gulf or illness that display really high levels of these. Um, and as well as in the several different brain regions that are involved in memory processing. Um, and then when we look at the blood uh, profiles in the mice, we see that there is abnormal DHA, we see that there's um, problems with fat breakdown uh, in the body. And we also see problems with how the um, energy metabolites look like in the blood, uh, particularly NAD. So focusing on that, uh, we developed in our mouse studies, we developed a, a strategy where we administered nicotinamide riboside. Um, we were hoping that in the mice, um, at least the hypothesis was in the mice, that if we correct the um, energy levels, restore the energy level of NAD um, by supplementing NAD, that the um, oxidative stress will go down, inflammation and will go down in the brain, and that will correspond with um, fatigue, reduce, reducing the fatigue and memory problems in the mice. Um, and so when we did that, um, as you can see here, oops, sorry. As you can see here in our mouse model, we were able to, um, if you look at the left side is the brain, the right side is the plasma. And you can see that the, the red um, box is the GWI mice. Uh, without the NR supplementation, you can, and compared to the blue, the control mice that did not have the NR supplementation, um, and then the hashed ones, blue hashed and the red hashed are the ones that received the NR supplementation. So you can see that NR um, boosts the, the levels of brain NAD and plasma NAD, um, and that in the, in the GWI mice, these levels are reduced in the brain and in the blood. Um, so, and then when we did the behavior testing on these mice, we saw that there was, um, you know, quite significant improvement in reducing fatigue and reducing memory problems. Um, so, based on this pilot work, we developed and designed the 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 NR clinical pilot study. Um, our goal is to to see that you know what we observed in mice does it really translate into human. Um, populations. Um, so we're going to be focusing on obviously on gulf or illness. Um, and we want to see whether the energy molecules that are disturbed in the blood of veterans with gulf or illness, can we restore that with NR, lower inflammation, and just improve the general health and well-being. So this is just really just to understand how um, this is a very pilot study and we hope to learn what we learn from it, then we can move it, move it into larger studies. Um, so if you want to learn more about the trial, we are hoping to start it next month. Um, Grace is on the line here as well. She'll be able to answer any questions here. Her number is here and she'll post it in the chat as well. So she's your main contact person. If you can please get in touch with, with, um, with Grace. Um, we, really, um, we really appreciate everything that uh, veterans have done so far in participating in the study. We have an ongoing clinical trial, OEA, which actually targets the fat distribution in the body um, to see if we can reduce inflammation. That trial is ongoing. So we have a number of clinical trials focused on Gulf War illness, and we'd really, um, we really need your, um, your help, your participation in the study. And thank you for all the veterans who have really made it possible um, to move this clinical trial forward. We already have um, close to 20 participants in our, um, in our um, already participating in the, the OEA clinical trial, and they'll be able to move on to this trial. And, um, and if, you know, if you haven't started with the OEA trial, you're welcome to start with the NR trial. So, so these options are available. We really look forward to hearing from you. So I just wanted to thank all the veterans again for, for their service and, and participation in these studies. Um, it would not be possible. I also want to um, um, and thank all the other veteran advocates. David Patterson has been with us for a while. Um, Nick Denise Nichols is always helping. Jimmy and uh, and Bo and everyone that's um, has come and participated in the studies as well. 
Um, we also want to thank our team at the Ross Camp Institute. Uh, we really work as a team, as a unit, to really make this happen. And this is how far we've gotten from bench to the translational. Uh, and we're hoping to get to the final um, stages of getting these out to approved and out to veterans as soon as possible. We want to thank our collaborator, especially Nancy and Kim and, um, and all the others, um, we, Aman and um, Jim Baruniak, Jim Zara, Dr. Hoffman, who really have put in a lot of effort in helping us move these trials and, and um, providing oversight. So thank you again, and thank you CDMRP for funding the trial. And um, you know, animal work was funded by the VA Marriott, so it was really a good collaborative effort between um, between everybody to make this happen. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Our final speaker today is Dr. Drew Helmer. Dr. Helmer is an expert in military exposures and deployment related health concerns and the impact of combat deployment on the health and well being of former military service members. He is Deputy Director of the Center for Innovations in Quality Effectiveness and Safety, IQUEST, at the Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center and Professor of Medicine in the section of Health Services Research at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He is former director of the War Related Illness and Injury Center Risk at the VA New Jersey Healthcare System. Dr. Helmer is a member of the Research Advisory Committee on Gulf War Veterans Illnesses, which advises the Secretary of VA on research strategy and a, champ and a VA champion for the VA DOD evidence based clinical practice guideline for the management of chronic multi symptom illness. In addition to caring for veterans and educating providers about post deployment health, Dr. Helmer studies healthcare utilization and outcomes important to deployed veterans, including chronic pain, military exposure concerns, depression, suicidal ideation, mild traumatic brain injury, and sexual health concerns. He has published more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and a book for the general population on these topics. I will now hand it over to you, Dr. Helmer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to need to do a quick tech check. Are my slides appearing now? Yes, they are. OK, perfect. Thank you. And um, today I'm going to be talking about the genomics of Gulf War illness. This is a, uh, a million veteran program project called that we call CSP 2006. And I'm co-chair, and I'll talk at the end of, about all of my the cast of thousands that work on this project with me. Um, Sorry, let's make sure we go. Okay, so, so what are we trying to do with this project? So the Million Veteran Program, as you might be aware, is a, a, a major initiative by the VA to uh, gather self-reported information, uh, genomic information, and medical record information on a million volunteers, a million veterans who volunteer to participate in this study so that we can uh, understand the mechanisms of disease and many diseases. With a, with a sample size that large, you really have a lot of opportunity to look for all sorts of different uh, health issues and, and the genetic underpinnings of those health issues. So it was recognized fairly early that, hey, this would be a great chance to look at Gulf War illness because, <clears throat> as, as many of you probably know, not everybody who was in the theater of war and possibly or even probably exposed to the same things got the same uh, symptoms. And so this person here was exposed to, to something. I was in the middle of this person there was, and, and maybe, maybe one of the three of us actually got what we call Gulf War illness now. So we think there's a genetic component to this. We think that there's a genetic predisposition and that there's a possibly an interaction between a person's genes and their exposures that might be causing the illness in, in Gulf War veterans. And so having a large sample um, and then focusing on this particular problem uh, is, a, is a rare opportunity uh, because it just takes a very large number of people to do this sort of work. And so CSP 2006, the Genomics of Gulf War Illness, was established <clears throat> to really understand those genetic 
contributions, that genetic under predisposition to go for illness among the MVP participants who were deployed uh, to the Gulf in 1990 and 91. This is specific for that, for that era, for that cohort. Uh, and so what we did is we characterized the cohort uh, of MV MVP participants and we uh, established their deployment status, uh, whether they were active duty at the time, but not deployed or deployed elsewhere and whether they were deployed to the Persian Gulf region. Um, and then what we do is what's called a genome-wide association study, which basically is almost like a survey of the genes in our, in our genome. So millions and millions of, of what we call SNPs, these little uh, units of genetic code. And we, we do a survey of almost a million of those and look for patterns. And then based on those patterns, we associate that with the, the presence of Gulf War illness, for example. And then from there, we can start to look at which genes that might be playing a role in Gulf War illness. Um, like I mentioned, another important piece of this is we actually want to look at how the environment interacts with those genes and might cause illness. And so we call that a gene by environment interaction analysis. Um, and so the survey that we did, we sent a survey to uh, 110,000 um, uh, MVP participants who were on active duty status during the 1990-91 thing. And when we looked at that, we wanted to um, gather information from them about their military experience, their branch, their component, where they were, and also their individual self-reported exposure, exposure information. So then pulling all of that together, <clears throat> we can start to answer some of these questions. We also have the possibility of looking at, like what Dr. Abdullah was just talking about, some of the omics, some of the other uh, components of the blood and of the, of the body's um, you know, uh, lymph cycle and looking at the metabolism, those metabolomics. Uh, that's another possibility that we can do with this, with this project. And all of this is kind of described in a design paper that was published not too long ago in Brain Sciences. So that's available if you have any questions. So, you know, I think a, a lot of people have heard about this project that maybe don't understand where it is and probably don't understand why it's taking so long. Um, the uh, timeline here shares some, some of that uh, background information. So the initial study was initiated in 2015. Uh, and then we did a pilot version of this with about 300 participants and refined the questionnaire and refined the processes. Uh, in 2016, we got some approvals that were really important, including the ability to use some of the Department of Defense data about deployment status so that we would have uh, we would know who to focus on in terms of who was on active duty during that time period. Uh, by 2017, <clears throat> you know, the MVP project had already been going for about three or four years. And so the number of participants in MVP was getting to be large enough where we could start to think about our subgroup of Gulf War veterans um, and Gulf War era veterans being large enough to meet our needs. And the questionnaire was finalized. And finally, in 2018, we actually sent out the surveys um, to, like I said, 110,000. I'll show you some more examples of that. Uh, there were actually the, the mailings of the initial surveys uh, was in two different batches, first one in late 2018, second one in early 2019. Um, and then once the results started to come back in, the information had to be uh, entered into databases and uh, cleaned and processed. And we started to formulate our analytic teams to really try to plan how we were going to take all of this information that was so valuable and that our veterans spent so much time answering those questionnaires and doing a really good job actually of completing those questionnaires. So there was a lot of planning about what we could do. And uh, we got kind of our first hint of some, some data uh, in mid 2019. And so we had a couple of abstracts that we were able to present to colleagues internally at what we call the MVP science meeting. In 2020, we had a little bit more data. Um, and so we were able to do a little bit more with some of our internal uh, presentations and works in progress sort of things. And finally, in 2021, we really have, we really got full access to the analytic data set, key variables have been created 
And the team is just working really hard to analyze these data and to get some of the results out. And so while I'm not going to talk specifically about findings from, from, the, from CSP 2006, you know, I do want to reassure you that very, very soon we're going to be able to publicly present um, actual findings from this study. Uh, to the next slide. Oh, that, that's just a list of uh, abbreviations. Just to give you a, a more a clearer picture of what we started with. So the MVP cohort at the time of the survey uh, administration was around 800, uh, around 650,000 people of whom there are about 110,000 who looked like they were Gulf War era veterans on active duty in 1990-91. So we mailed that, we mailed this questionnaire to 110,000 people, MVP participants. We got 45,000 surveys back. Um, 4,000 of those, or almost 10%, actually were missing some of the most critical information, which was the symptom responses. So we couldn't create a Gulf War illness status from those questionnaires. And so we have excluded those from further analysis. That left us with about 41,077 individuals, of whom 300 were missing deployment status, and we couldn't confirm their deployment status using the DOD records. So we're left with just under 41,000 individuals of whom 14,000 were deployed and 26,000, almost 700 were not deployed. So this cohort is the largest cohort of Gulf War era veterans characterized by deployment status and by health characteristics that allow us to create uh, a Gulf War illness status for them. So this is really important because it's not just going to create opportunities to do these genetic and gene by environment analyses, but there are many other questions that really can be answered now with this cohort that could really not be answered with any other assembled cohort of Gulf War veterans. So progress to date, um, uh, like I said, we've got a design manuscript that kind of describes our primary analyses. We've had uh, preliminary analyses presented at our internal meetings in the last three years. We have had a couple of presentations at public meetings related to some of the more technical um, aspects of, of diversity, racial and ethnic genetic diversity in, our, in the MVP cohort more broadly. We've got new people coming into the pipeline. We have a lot of postdoctoral trainees, fellows, uh, doctoral candidate who are contributing you know, wonderful things to this team and actually represent the future of research and have you know, now had some exposure and have developed some expertise in Gulf War illness. And I think that's really exciting and promising. Um, and at this moment, we have five approved manuscript writing groups. One is looking at the phenotype. So how do we define Gulf War illness? And what does that Gulf War illness look like in this sample? So we're comparing those who are deployed and those who are not deployed and looking at Gulf War illness. Um, an exposure writing group looking at the self-reported exposures that we gathered from the survey. We're also doing a, a paper, working on a paper about recontacting. So, you know, this fact that we mailed out a follow-up uh, survey to 110,000 people, that was the first time MVP had ever done that. Uh, it's probably one of the larger uh, surveys that the VA has done for research purposes. And so we're going to talk about that in a manuscript. And then we have these two papers looking at that genome-wide association study, just to understand the basic possible link between genetics and Gulf War illness. And then that follow-up gene by environment manuscript or analysis to look at that interaction between your genetics and your exposures. Um, and then we have this other uh, project to, to take what we know about the 41,000 people and see if we can extrapolate a Gulf War illness status using a combination of the survey and the medical record data for the other 60,000 people who were, who were Gulf War or Gulf War era veterans, because that will give us a larger sample that we can actually, um, we'll have more power to detect some of these uh, differences and some of these associations. So the next steps, uh, we're really working hard to analyze and publish and disseminate our findings. I really appreciate the opportunity to share, share our progress with you today. Um, I think really importantly, we've heard from the community, from the Gulf War veteran community and from the clinicians who care for Gulf War veterans. 
that there are some really important uh, questions about Gulf War illness and COVID. And so we have a proposal right now uh, to amend our protocol to extend or expand our anal analysis and to get some additional funding to answer some questions about Gulf War illness and COVID. Um, like I said, this is not about the genetics at this moment. There, there are some really interesting genetic questions too, but at least the preliminary uh, questions are here on the screen and, and, and they're focused on you know, what does, what does COVID mean for Gulf War veterans? Uh, you know, am I gonna get sick or, you know, am I gonna have a, a problem with the vaccine? You know, is it, is, does the vaccine work as well for me? And so those are some of the questions we can ask with this answer with this large cohort that can't really be answered with other, other cohorts. Um, and then I think there are some other analyses that we really wanna do um, as part of building out the research opportunities and expanding the questions related to CSB 2006, including looking at uh, neurologic conditions, patterns of healthcare use, uh, the, the concerns about suicidal ideation and suicide risk can go for veterans. Um, and of course, we also want to apply and explore the impact of different case definitions of Gulf War illness on some of these uh, analyses as well as related conditions or conditions that might be related or, or appear similar to Gulf War illness like uh, other chronic multi-symptom illnesses, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome. So here is the, uh, the very large team. MVP is known for a team science approach and CSP 2006 is no exception to that. Uh, it's a very diverse group of people um, at all levels of training and experience and across, uh, gosh, at least, at least six different VA medical centers and medical schools. Um, and so it's, it's been a, a joy to work with all, with all these people and we're all very committed to to moving this forward and getting some answers to you as soon as possible. So I think that's it for me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Helmer. And uh, thank you to our fantastic group of speakers today. We will now be answering some of the questions that came in for, for, for the live Q&A session. Um, and as a reminder to our attendees, you can use the Q&A box in your webinar control panel to submit your questions. Um, I would like to invite our speakers to turn on their cameras and unmute and uh, Dr. Klimas will kick it off with some of the questions that came in. Oh, great. Okay, and I'm trying to put on my video too. It says that I can't because the host stopped it. Okay, stop my video. There you go. So, um, Hi, everybody, and thank you, my the brilliant speakers that have been talking to us. Um, I really appreciate it. We have a, a lot of questions that are in the Q&A, and I'm going to pose a couple of them. Let me start the first one to Kim. Kim, people are asking um, questions about other types of exposures. And for instance, when they blew up the sarin and it wafted over people, were those people at greater risk? of having Gulf War illness than people who weren't in those exposure zones. Do you know? Uh, yeah, well, so it, it looks like if you were exposed to low level sarin, that you may, yes, be an increased risk of having Gulf War illness. That's my understanding. And I think that that's important um, to, to understand. Uh, Drew, people are asking in the Q&A, if there's going to be any work, if you're understanding genetic risk through the MVP program of whether or not we're going to get to the next generation and know whether or not their children are at risk, or if there's any, we had, well, I had the question before from veterans who said, my father was exposed to Agent Orange and now I'm sick with Gulf War. Is there any linkage there? Can you connect those dots in any kind of way? So the, the MVP uh, data do not allow us to look at that directly. Um, I do know that's a, an area of, you know, great concern. Um, and of course, there was a National Academy of Sciences uh, report recently that talked to, that the VA commissioned uh, to look at, in, they call the generational effects of military exposures. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in trying to create the right platforms and the right opportunities for studying that 
that exact issue. Um, I think the role of epigenetics is probably going to be pretty important. And while we can look at some of the epigenetics in the Million Veteran Program cohort using the samples, um, that's still kind of uh, uh, under development in terms of how we can do that. So I think it, I think there's some potential there. And certainly with this cohort of Gulf War veterans as part of CSP 2006, I think there is the potential for um, understanding that risk uh, up to future generations a little bit better, but it will take some additional data collection and information. Like obviously you would need to know what happened to the children um, or what happened with regard to uh, pregnancy outcomes uh, in order to to really answer some of those questions. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, I had a whole bunch of questions that were submitted ahead of time that aren't in the Q&A, but, but came in through our email. Um, many of them are clinical questions asking about treatments and things that I'm going to defer on those right now, unless we have, maybe at the end I can try to handle some of that stuff. But the um, researchy kind of questions, um, um, another good one for Drew. Drew, the, the, um, there's a question about long COVID and whether or not it's similar to Gulf War illness, but I think that raises the, the study you were describing. You wanna go into a little bit more about, about that? Right, so, so the, the initial questions that we're, we're going to look at uh, if, we're, if we're funded with this extra focus um, related to COVID will answer more questions about um, our Gulf War veterans with Gulf War illness at greater risk of complications of COVID or, or perhaps even at greater risk of developing long COVID, which could just look like an exacerbation or a, a worsening of Gulf War illness symptoms. Because certainly when you think about the description of long COVID that, that's, that's out there right now, it does sound very familiar, kind of brain fog and fatigue and uh, lack of endurance or you know, post, post, post exertional sort of malaise. Um, so there certainly seem to be some similarities. Uh, I think at this point, you know, there is not, I, I would say there's re really no, no strong evidence that there was a viral uh, contributing factor to Gulf War illness, you know, in 1990-91. I think most of the focus has been on some of these environmental uh, exposures and some of the prophylactic agents, the neurotoxicant effects of of a combination of these things uh, as, as the likely underlying cause of Gulf War illness as opposed to a, a virus. But you know that doesn't mean that the effects couldn't be similar and therefore some of the treatments might be similar. So I think that is something that we can explore a little bit more. You know, the nice thing about you know, the, the MVP cohort is that you know, we do have blood samples um, and we do have um, information. There, there is actually a, uh, there was a follow-up survey related to COVID, COVID experience among the MVP cohort in uh, around June of 2020. And so there is some COVID specific information. And then of course the VA has a COVID data resource. And so for veterans who use the VA, we have a, a curated data set from the medical records, from the electronic medical records that allow us to look at some COVID specific uh, care and uh, experience, uh, including test results and um, hospitalization. So, so I think, you know, getting back to the question, there, there's a whole bunch of possibilities. Our initial focus isn't, for, for this, for CSP 2006, is not going to be, is COVID, long COVID the same as Gulf War illness? But I do know there are other people who are going to propose uh, studies to look at that. Um, because I, I agree, it is an interesting and important question, uh, but we're going to be focusing on kind of the outcomes of COVID and the risks of COVID for Gulf War veterans. Thank you very much. I, I know that we recently sent a have you had COVID and what did it do to you survey to the people that are in this registry that I referred to. So that'll be interesting to see how, how that might align with some of the this work that you just are starting to report on, Drew. Leila, we have some, I have a question ahead of time, uh, uh, and it's a great question. It asks, you're doing lipidomic work, and then there's proteomic work, and there's metabolomic work. For the average person who's just trying to understand why, what are these tools you're using, and what do they teach us? 
Can you talk about that for a moment? Sure, I will do my best. Um, so, you know, um, for traditional science work, we've, for a long time, we've just done, we've been able to do one molecule at a time. It's like, oh, look at this one molecule um, and understand what it's doing. However, in the recent last two decades, there's been vast amount of technologies available um, that can allow us to look at several thousand molecules in just one single experiment. And so that's just opened up the biology, understanding the biology a lot faster than we've been able to do in the decades ago. Um, and just the availability of these instruments, in instruments to you know, general scientists and most result, you know, they're more readily available um, to a lot of the scientists than they used to be. So, you know, an illness as complex as Gulf War illness, that, that kind of technology really helps us to just scan, uh, do a large scan, and then use the computational tools that, you know, that you refer to and others have referred to, referred to, uh, to use to look at the knowledge generated and quickly look at um, how many different functions, biological functions and biological systems are affected so that we can use, um, then try to understand the biology a bit better. So I think, you know, just the fact that we can scan thousands and thousands of things at the same time, that's basically what these proteomic and lipidomic and metabolomics tools have been able to do. They're just tools, but what it's helping us get to the science faster. Thank you very much. There's a, several questions here about people who um, wonder why we can't get this science done faster. What's getting in the way of our recruitment? Why, why can't we find veterans that want to do this work? And a whole bunch of people in the chat were saying, well, gosh, I never even heard of this before. Why don't we know about you? Why haven't we heard? We want to do this, but we've never heard about this before. So Zach, I'm going to throw a question at you. Zach, what are we doing wrong that we haven't been able to inform people well enough that we, how desperately this work needs them to progress? I think one, I think one thing that we're not, that we could be better at, I don't want to say we're doing it wrong. I, I want to say that we could be better at is taking a data-driven approach to what it is that we're doing. You know, we, we ask these, we, we try these things out. We need to be able to measure what is it? drive in terms of interactions? What does it drive in terms of, you know, interested people that are getting the information, you know, back to us, right? That say, I want to participate. Um, that's one thing we could be better at. Another thing we could be better at is, uh, I touched on it before, um, Ross Camp is doing great work at, over in Tampa. Um, well, I believe we're doing great work in Miami. We obviously work with Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Helmer. Um, there needs to be a better way to connect each other, you know, obviously at the PI, PI level, um, scientist level, you guys are doing great work and talk to each other all the time. We need to be better at the coordinator level so that I know what's happening everywhere in the country and that depending on the veteran that does get in touch with someone, that person is then able to pivot what, what they can, if it's not the best fit, what is available, right? Just having it on clinicaltrials.gov isn't enough. Um, I think that we need to be better at getting this information out there from a grassroots perspective. I think that um, everybody that's, I, I know several advocates that do a great job reaching out to their networks, um, getting the word out is important. Um, Dr. Klein has mentioned earlier that we need females that have got, that, uh, that are healthy, healthy females. Um, they were, they were very difficult to find, right? Um, that's, that's taking a more, grassroots approach um, to, uh, to, to find that, that cohort. We need to be better at getting the word out any way possible is the answer to the question. So um, one thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to be better about advertising. We're trying to be better about interfacing with the offices of public affairs at the VA, which can be difficult at times. I say that as a VA employee on a recorded line very carefully. Um, at the same time, we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to do non-VA directed uh, uh, communications. Um, you know, we've we've done some brainstorming. We hope to have some improvements coming down the pipe 
And, and obviously, if we're successful, the next step is to share that method of success with our fellow investigators that are, that are doing this work um, because it takes a village. It's the only way that this is gonna get done. Thanks, Zach. Um, I, I can't tell you enough, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, the people that would come to something like this are the very people that participate in our studies. But right now, we could get you real answers that would result in drugs that are on the formulary in just a few years if we had just outstanding recruitment. But I can tell you from past experience that we don't have outstanding. We, 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 we try every trick. We do what we can to get people into these studies. We, the patients are paid well to be in the studies. There's travel money to be in the studies. I mean, we try to reduce the barriers so that people can come. And then we even created all these virtual studies. You don't have to go anywhere. You can do from your own home. And, and still, the, this, like this study that we're about to launch with Bacopa, you could recruit that whole study and be, could everyone be out of that study in six months because it's virtual. If we had enough people um, to reach out to and have them all sign up in the first few months, we would be done with the study within the year and have a really solid answer in a well-powered study. Very cool. But we don't have the patience. So we don't have the study subjects to recruit to these studies. And it's just something we're doing wrong. Part of it, and it's not, I shouldn't say we're doing it wrong. I'm sorry, we need the veteran partners to be so partnered, the advocates to be so keen on this. You can't, at some point, blame the government for not doing enough if at this point enough is just signing up for the studies. If we could just get people in the studies, we would have the very answers. We are funded, we have amazing studies. We are not the only ones, everyone, there's, as I say, there's 15 studies recruiting right now on trials that go, but there's just not um, enough connectedness to the people who, um, who could and maybe should and maybe want to participate. And, and so we're just begging everyone to you know, use that, that ripple effect of your own social media to put out these announcements and ask people to repost them and put them in their Facebooks and their Twitters and their this and their that's so that we get the word out. And we really appreciate all the help we can get and all your very good ideas. This consortium has an advocacy committee. A number of them are right here on the, in the chat room right now. I see that Marilyn Harris is there and Denise is there. You can reach out to people. Jimmy, of course, is the chair. Jimmy Rocco is on the chair of that committee. Reach out to them and give us your brilliant ideas on how to find people because we need your, your help with that. Um, so Dr. Klimas. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Uh, Dr. Klimas, I already want to add, um, I am always interested in hearing ideas. I am always interested in being better. I'm a very competitive person. So I want to <laughs> beat at least Layla's project <laughs> with my recruitment before I finish helping her get to her recruitment. But, uh, I'm uh, very competitive and want to be better. That last slide I showed that had a link to what we're calling the clearinghouse is, is another way to, to um, to get the word out because that way you're not recruiting for a particular study. You're just giving us a way to tell you about all of the studies, not just our studies, everybody's studies, so that we can uh, try this, as Zach was saying, to, so you can find the right fit study for you. So we really would appreciate that. Um, I didn't want to get off on this, this too far because we had some important questions. And um, one of them was about the risk of cancer. We hear cancer, 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 and our clinical patients, we see cancer, cancer, cancer. But do we have any data to support that there's an increased risk for cancer in Gulf War illness? I'll let any one of y'all try to grab that answer. It's a great question, uh, Nancy, and I wish we had a little more information. Um, so VA used to do reports regularly on, on other outcomes in Gulf War veterans. I've not seen that in a while. I don't know if, if Drew knows if it's still happening. When I was part of the RAC committee, we used to monitor that regularly to check for those. Uh, I don't know if that's still happening. It was a quarterly report. I'm sure it's not being done quarterly, but I don't know if it's being done yearly at this point. One thing we do know in the past, brain cancer was increased in veterans who had uh, sarin exposure. So that was something we saw for a while that seemed to be a high risk, a higher risk. Um, that is the only one I can think of off the top of my head that we know seem to have been in an increased risk related to 
Gulf War service. Uh, we, there were some ticks over time of a couple of other potential types of cancer, but as far as I know, I have not seen any recent reports uh, from VA uh, watching that. Um, so there were a couple of papers that were put out um, looking at cancer registries from different states that VA had put together. Um, and, and I believe it was the brain cancer one was the only one I can think of that seemed to look uh, increased over time. There was a, a, perhaps a question of lung cancer, but then I think that went back down. Hey, this is Drew. Can I share my screen? Sure. Um, uh, so this is not from the CSP 2006. This is from CSP 585, but this is their publication. Um, and this was, a, this was a survey of about 1,300 Gulf War veterans and Gulf War era veterans deployed and not deployed. And so you can see here that they're reporting um, the cancer risk, you know, among the deployed and the not deployed. Um, you can see the suppressed means that the numbers are so small that they're not allowed to report them, meaning they're, they're fewer than 10. Um, but the, um, the risk among those who did deploy is not higher in this sample. Now, this has been done in other studies as well, and we will be able to do something similar with our larger CSP 2006 uh, cohort. Um, and so we will have a better chance of detecting a difference between those who deployed and those who did not deploy. Um, like I said, these are self-reported cancers. So there are some limitations you know, with that. If you die of a cancer, you can't report it. Um, but we will also be able to look at the medical record data, looking at the diagnosis codes. So I think very soon we should be able to have at least a, a descriptive report of you know, whether, whether we see a signal but I agree with Dr. Sullivan right now, there was an early uh, indication of possible increase in brain cancer that was not sustained over time, but we, don't, we haven't seen anything else yet. So um, we're actually out of time. It looks like it's already one o'clock. Um, I'm gonna volunteer to stay back and answer some of these more clinical questions because um, there's a bunch of them. But there's, I don't think we'll put that on the, on the vid video or whatever. So I just should try to be helpful. But, um, but I want to thank our speakers. I mean, you were amazing, and I really appreciate it. I'm sorry for the technical glitch that messed up my talk at the end. I don't know what that was. It was random. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, it's great to have you all here. There was a tremendous amount of work, talk on the chat. There was a great set of questions in, um, in the um, Q&A. We'll make an effort to answer some of these things on screen too. I think that there's a way when we put up the video to put some of the Q&A below and, and do some of the, put the answered questions in there as well as uh, try to answer some of them if they're answerable. Um, Oh, I'm going to ask one last question because it's asked a bunch here and I don't, I don't know the answer and it's going to be from you probably, Kim, the, the oil, the oil exposures, that's in a lot of your work, but there's someone on the Q&A saying that that's not considered a risk factor. I, I always thought it was a risk factor for Gulf War. A am I incorrect? We have not seen it specifically related to Gulf War illness. Although we know that veterans had many mixed exposures during this deployment and there were 600 oil wells on fire during that time. So I have no doubt that there may be some other things going on there, but we have not seen it directly as a risk factor um, now, for Gulf War. Maybe that here. We control for other things. And I did want to, I did see something about the naval question. Yeah. Um, the naval exposures are very interesting and I would be very much interested in talking with this veteran and any others about that. So um, naval, uh, personnel were actually one of the only ones who, as a job description, were pesticide applicators. Uh, and we actually had a study of pesticide applicating uh, where we went all around the country to talk to those who were doing that. Um, and so some of the naval um, personnel really got a lot of exposure to uh, pesticides and other things on ships. So, you know, it, it was thought initially that, you know, the naval personnel would have less exposures because it was less on the ground, but it turns out that may not be the case. So there's certainly quite a lot of, of naval exposures that are a little bit different than some, some of the other branches that we certainly came to learn as we, we went around the country and talked to a lot of veterans. So absolutely happy to talk with some of you about that. 
Super, that's great. Well, I'm gonna um, just sort of wind this up. I'm gonna say just a few things clinically. The, the risks, the war-related um, injuries centers, um, I, and I got, um, Wes is on the, I see Wes is here, and I think I saw uh, Dr. Chandler was on here earlier. These risks are the, the expert sites in the VA for dealing with complex uh, war-related or rather military deployment-related injuries uh, that of toxic exposures. And it doesn't matter if it was Gulf War or OIF or any other exposures, you, you're certainly eligible to get the, a consult. And it's easy to get one. It's right there. Your primary care doctor can just put a consult in to the wrists and they can... Um, do a nice chart review and, and engage an interdisciplinary team in your care. They've been extremely helpful to a lot of veterans. And, and now that we're so good at virtual things, you don't have, no longer even have to attempt to fly across the country or into one of the risk sites, you're, you're, they're accessible to you. Um, and they're regional. The, there's a, one in DC for sort of everything South and one in um, New Jersey for all of New England and to then, I don't know how we get to the Mississippi River. And then poor West has got the, the Palo Alto risk has got pretty much the entire West in, into the middle of the country. So there's a, a great deal that you can learn from the risks. The theme there was interdisciplinary. The other thing you can do is, is because there's community care consults and because some of the VAs have integrative medicine clinics now, you can ask for an integrative medicine consult because that is also an interdisciplinary kind of way of trying to glue together what is wrong in, in these complex patients or an environmental um, illness expert in your community. So if you, if you can't find someone in your VA that's expert, you can ask for community care uh, consultation for someone in your community that is expert. And there I would look at the integrative or functional medicine groups or the environmental medicine groups because they know a lot about detoxification pathways, mitochondria, oxidative stress and inflammation, very helpful. So that, that way uh, is really something for every veteran, even if you can't necessarily find it in, in your local VA. I think the local VAs have changed so much since I've been there. I mean, right now uh, we have a clinic Used to be, I was the only person that could see environmental medicine patients, but we have a clinic in the Miami VA that's absolutely an integrated medicine approach clinic. It's doing really wonderful work. And they're also caring for the post COVID patients, which have very similar kinds of presentations. So th there actually is things that can be done and, and, and uh, you don't have to sit on your hands waiting for, for answers. There are some answers already there. There'll be a lot more as, as if we can recruit these studies and get them to you. That's the, the bottom line. The faster we recruit, the faster we get your answers. So that's the theme of this meeting. Recruit, help, help, recruit. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, just to reiterate what you were saying, Nancy, um, just, you know, getting um, when we have veterans come in for our studies and we ask if you have a colleague or two, you could just tell about our study. That would make all the difference. Honestly, one or two people that, you know, we haven't talked to before or haven't come in, you know, for each person that comes in could make all the difference for making, meeting our recruitment goals for our studies. Absolutely. We're not asking you to get a hundred people. We're asking you to get one or two. If yeah. If everyone brought one or two in, we'd be there. Um, I think Sarah, you have some closing comments. Yes. Thank you. Um, let me just share my slide because we have some something really helpful. Um, I, I want to again thank our speakers again for presenting today um, and uh, everyone for attending. Uh, we really appreciate your help. Um, the following link that you see on the screen will allow you to set up a time and a date to speak with a member of our research recruitment team. Um, free, feel, free, feel free to write the URL down on a sheet of paper or um, Zena is going to post a link in the chat box. You can um, click on that and I'll direct you to make an appointment with us um, either this week or well today or next week. Um, we wanted to make speaking to our research team as accessible for you as possible. Um, you'll see three services available. Please select the service that best fit your needs. There are explanations for each service if you're not sure which one to select. 
I'm going to just leave that up on the screen. Again, it's going to be in the chat box. Um, Zena will be posting it in there. And uh, just some closing remarks. I'm going to conclude. Um, we're going to conclude with uh, our Gulf War veteran and research associate and chair for GWCTIX uh, Patient Advisory Committee, Jimmy Orocho. I'm going to hand it over you to, to you, Jimmy. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. I most importantly want to thank you, the viewers attending. I want to thank you for, for your continued support, advocacy, and the, importantly, for your investment in Gulf War illness research. Very important. Uh, uh, as veterans, Persian Gulf War veterans specifically, uh, you are our center of gravity and an integral member of our progress understanding Gulf War illness. Very important. Researchers, researchers' understanding of environmental exposure illnesses and care of veterans can only be improved and advances in science and healthcare with the willingness of volunteers that take part in clinical research. We wouldn't be able to have come this far without you, and we are dedicated to continuing our research efforts for Gulf War illness. So in the coming days, so in the coming days, in the coming days, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's recording, which you can, which can also be found at the Institute's YouTube channel. And please don't forget to connect to GWCTIC, so connect to our consortia and the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine on social media to stay current, upcoming research events, quarterly newsletters, and much, much more. Connect to us and we'll be glad to keep this information flowing. Lastly, thank you again for attending. Be safe and have a wonderful day.